Robert Kinsel, welcome. Pleasure. Um, we're impressed you're here because I, I thought you might still be wearing your tux from the Met Gala, the red and black, lovely bow tie we saw you in. Uh, how was it? Um, so first of all, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, when I heard I could go to a real life conference, I was like, let's do it. <laughs> it's awesome. And uh, so thank you. Um, yes, it was fun. It was great to see so many, um, so many great people in person. And, and uh, you, secret, yeah. I recycled my tux from two years ago. Oh, did I you? I did not do a new one. Wow. It still, <laughs> it still fit. It still fit. That's I what was you're like, more All right, I'll go with in. that. Just different bow tie. And it's interesting because, in a way, you know, going to the Met Gala, and you took. I think this is the second or third year you've taken your key YouTubers. You know, you've picked yeah. them, and you, you you pay thousands for this table. But it's still the entry level sort of is so stringent, isn't it? And it's the complete opposite of YouTube, in a way. YouTube is democracy, you know, all voices yes. welcome, and the Met Gala is totally Met Gala is tightly controlled by Anna. Yeah. Anna Wintour, who does an incredible job of curating uh, the attendees. And uh, we're incredibly lucky that uh, we're allowed to purchase a table and bring guests. <laughs> right, and, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but I think what happens is uh, we bring, you know, wonderful, wonderful, um, sort of diverse um, by all types uh, uh, creators to to Matt and they're all incredibly accomplished. And, Who did you take this year? I did see um, the picture. Uh, Eugene, uh, Eugene Lee, um, Addison Ray, Nikki Tutorials. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's going to be lots of names that you probably don't know, but like huge, huge creator, creators, Addison Ray. Um, I'm forgetting, uh, Jackie, Aina. Yeah. Um, so we just had an incredibly diverse group of incredibly and it, accomplished creators. Yeah. And it's interesting you said, oh, lots of names you might not know, but you know, Eugene um, yeah. Lee Yang had 19 million people watching yes. coming out video, right? So the fact yes. that you think people still might not know who he is tells us something about where yeah. YouTube sits, right? It's, it's fascinating. I want to know a little bit about you, though, before we go into the business. Oh. Um, Kinsel, do you still have to spell it every day to someone at least I once just, a day? <laughs> I just did yesterday on, on the plane. <laughs> you just have, <laughs> I do it and all the time. You see, I, I, Romeo Alpha November, Victor India Romeo Sierra India November yeah. Golf Hotel is my name in phonetic. I have to do it five times a day. So I, I know what you mean. But yeah. it's interesting because the surname tells us something. It tells us something immediately about your background, your history, where you come from in the world. Do you know what it means? I don't. By the way, no one has ever guessed the country that it comes from. Oh. My, like, I lived 25 years in the United States. No one has ever guessed. No one's guessed ever guessed it. Okay. Well, we'll find out in a minute <laughs> but when you tell us. But it was interesting because I, there isn't a, I'd looked it up and I was thinking, what's the meaning of this name? Because names often mean something, don't they? And, I, and actually, there isn't a single meaning, but I don't know whether you find this interesting. There are three meanings that come up for Kinsel. Brave counsel, wishful thinking, and hopes for the future. Which Wish, I, wishful thinking. Which, which I thought, actually, were great parameters for this conversation. Yeah. Um, tell us a bit about your family history. And indeed, you were brought up in a, in a communist regime, weren't you? Yeah. Uh, and that tells us a lot about, perhaps, about your worldview of opening up voices. Yeah. Um, so, so I grew up in communist Czechoslovakia uh, up until the Iron Curtain fell. And then I went to college uh, two years later in the United States. And then life happened, and, and, and here I am. And um, um, against the wishes of my mom, uh, you know. Who, oh, your, who, what will your family do? Yeah, their, and uh, and uh, so, so I grew up in communist. So I would say I live half of my life as communist and half of my life as capitalist. Grew up in a completely closed society. And um, um, my family is full of doctors. Dad was a doctor. My mom was a teacher, my sister was a doctor, her husband was a doctor, my niece was a doctor, there was a doctor, I was supposed to be a doctor, and I was the black sheep in the family who what a disappointment, didn't right? know uh, <laughs> what I do. I just didn't want to study that hard. Yeah. The censorship, though, you yeah. know, is, is, is perhaps for many of us uh, just a, a word that we hear, and we, but we haven't lived it. You've lived yep. censorship. Yep. To me, uh, yeah, it, it's really funny for me to sort of watch the debates that are sort of shaping, you know, taking shape on the global stage about uh, political systems and censorship and communism, socialism, all of those words that people sort of throw around without truly understanding what they mean. Right. Uh, I've lived it. And um, so for me, you know, I have this, uh, I have this uh, anecdote that I use quite a lot, but it never gets tired for me because uh, openness means a lot for me. Because when I, when I was growing up, 
uh, when I was in high school, um, uh, I, w I was in a uh, boarding high school um, for athletes, and uh, we used to listen to uh, uh, Voice of America and Radio Free Europe on a transistor radio. There, and those radio stations were broadcast from West Germany into Czech Republic. The Czech Republic gov government would scramble the frequency so we couldn't really hear it in any kind of reasonable quality. So it was really poor quality. Mm -hmm. And it was usually music, news, and sports, those three content types. And we would listen to it, and it was the only way that we would get any kind of news from outside the country or outside the Eastern Bloc. And of course, you know, Europeans are like it was completely different than what we would read in the papers or see on TV. And that was our life. So, so for me, those were like the two sort of trickles of information which were free. And so, so you know, now I'm obviously working on a platform that's open and that's, that's giving uh, openness a different shape. So for me, it's personal. Like I've lived it, I know the other side. And so, so I value uh, openness. Uh, quite a lot. It's, yeah. it's really, when you haven't had it, you value it more when you get yeah. it right. Um, so you talk about those little radios uh, in, in, the, in the boarding room dormitories there, but what was your first bit of tech that you ever either bought or you held, and, and can you remember um, what device? It, so it was not in check. I didn't even know how to use a computer or type when I came to the United States, so I had to, and then I two weeks in college, I learned that we have to actually type the papers. So I had to learn how to type in two weeks, which was uh, interesting. <laughs> but uh, I would say it was the first, the first thing was probably one of the early Mac computers in, in uh, 1995. I forget the model of it. It was, uh, it was a lap, like one of the first laptops that they had. And then the StarTech Motorola phone in, in late 90s. And you've talked a, a bit about that, you know, how your background has formed your worldview and then has, obviously, you bring that personal view, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, into your workplace. You've, you've only ever, I think, worked for two, I mean, media giants. You know, you worked for Netflix and then to YouTube. Why, why did you make that move? Um, so when I, was, when I was at YouTube, so Ben was right when he was talking about the DVDs in his keynote. It, because that's how I started, uh, work on the DVD deals for, uh, for Netflix. And uh, when Netflix had 500,000 subscribers, imagine that. And, um, and, then, and then 2005, I started to work on streaming, which we then launched in uh, 2007. And, and it was just a crazy ride. And then when I was approached by uh, Google to come to YouTube, um, I could see how unfigured out it was back then. Just when was this, 2010? 2010, yeah. yeah. And uh, from, from the different meetings with different people, I, I could see it was completely unfigured out. And, um, and so, so to me, what was attractive was anything that I had done before was about subscriptions. So I was at HBO for a little bit. I was at a kid's subscription service prior to Netflix, which was online. Um, Netflix was subscription, so everything was ad-free subscription. Um, and YouTube was the opposite of that, and I figured, I kind of know the other side. This would be an incredible challenge. It's unfigured out. I can be part of the team that figures it out, maybe. And, um, and, and it's a completely different skill set. It's advertising, it's global, it's open, and all the challenges that come with it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was the mountain that we had to climb that, that was really attractive. And, and so under your sort of leadership and you, you being there, it has gone, hasn't it, from sort of grainy cat videos to now, you know, being a platform for, you know, professionals, the public, it's a completely different model from what it was when you went there. Just can you give us a, a, a sort of, a little bit of the movement from grainy cat videos to where we are today? Yeah, it's, um, it was really interesting. It really started with grainy home videos, basically. And, um, and then over the years, you know, in, in um, sort of 2007, eight or so, we were sued by many different media companies um, because it was a totally different model. Lots of people are uploading uh, their videos, other people's videos, other Music people's content. Music as well was a Music, big one, wasn't it? Yeah. All of that to YouTube. Piracy accusations. Uh -huh. And nobody could figure out really what to do about it. So there were lots of lawsuits uh, against us at that time. So like one of the first things that we started to do is, is say, okay, let's figure out uh, some ways that we can get people paid for when somebody else uploads their content. So we developed a technology called Content ID, which fingerprints all the content. And then if we have an agreement, then we're sending the revenue to the copyright holder versus the uploader. 
And uh, then we, of course, had to convince companies to start using it and start monetizing. And we basically went from being sued back then to then having them start using Content ID to just watch it, then to unblock it, then to not block it, then monetize it, then start uploading their own uh, original content, uh, sometimes long-form content. So it was a full spectrum of activities that happened over the last um, you know, 10 years. And now media companies represent roughly 25% of YouTube watch time globally. The other 25% is music, and 50% is YouTube creators. So it's a sort of a well-diversified platform for all media types, and we have a very sizable business with all, all the broadcasters. And have the, can you remember a moment or those moments where you really felt that surge, that you could feel it surging forward and, and, and evolving in front of your eyes? Or was it, def was it much slower in, in actual time? I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the words of Cecile, who's here, who uh, used to work for me for, for a little bit. And she says, we are so spoiled with the growth that we have because we think it's slow, and everyone else would, would, would see this as a breakneck speed. Um, so I was, I was about to say it just kind of felt gradual, but it's been kind of a sprint over the last 10 years. And, and it's been uh, incredible growth rate, and especially in the last few years, it's really accelerated. And of course, um, the openness is, uh, is, is, the, is the fingerprint uh, of YouTube, but with that, of course, comes the risk of harmful content, yeah. and that risk is high. Um, and during the pandemic, conspiracy theories obviously became sort of rife. How, how do you deal with that Be beyond, besides the, what happened in the pandemic? We can talk about that separately because of the 5G towers and all that sort of stuff. But just in general, how, at what point did you realize that actually this risk of harmful content is something that you have to concentrate on really hard in order to make YouTube mm. a trustworthy platform? So, so for us, this work, because we've been sort of the early leader in open uh, platform video, uh, Content moderation is something that we've worked on for a very long time, over a decade. Um, it's just has gotten a lot more attention in the last five years and in the last two years or so everywhere else. For us, it's been part of our life all along. Um, the, the, you know, so I spoke about the importance of openness and how personal it is to me, et cetera. But what's also important is that in order to have an open platform, you have to have principled approaches, principled approach to uh, moderating content on it. Mm. And for us, uh, we had many different strategies to deal with it, but we couldn't really figure out how to effectively communicate them to people because we always felt like we had to have a two-hour meeting to convey what we're doing, and nobody is willing to give us that much time. So, so we came up with something that summarizes it in four R's. Remove, reduce, raise, and reward. And, and those are four different ways that we handle content on YouTube. Removing something means we have to have policies that allow us to remove violative content. How much do you remove? We, we I can't remember the stats of the, of the top of my head right now, but oh, actually I do. We just released publicly violative view rates. We really focus more on, rather than how much we remove, is how much violative content actually gets viewed. And in April of this year, uh, we released something called violative view rate, which tells us how many uh, you know, which is 0.16 of a percent. So let's say out of 10,000 views, 16 views would be violative. And, uh, and that reduced by 70% from the year before. So, um, so what we're focusing on is making sure that that number just keeps on, you know, it's either flat or goes down. And, um, and for us, but what, what I want to describe is the principle, which is uh, you need to have a set of policies mm -hmm that allow you to make these decisions in a principled way rather than subjective way. And in order to develop a policy, it takes many months to do so because we stress test it many, many different ways uh, with lots of different experts. Yeah. And, so uh, that's the remove bit. That's the remove bit. And then uh, the reduce bit is one where uh, somebody may be consistently coming up to the, to the borderline, you know, to the, to the line, but not cross it. So we know that it's getting gamed, that they really study our systems and game it. So we cannot remove it based on the first principles, but we don't owe it any recommendations, any sort of any work, you know, good work of our engineers to drive more watch time. So, so we, 
reduce it by not giving, you know, it, it gets whatever demand it generates on its own. But you don't it found get, the flames of it in any it way? Don't, it doesn't get any help from us. Right. And then race is, um, is something which is the opposite, which is, uh, for instance, we work with news publishers all around the world uh, to make sure that we're raising content from organizations which are doing fact checking and are rep reputable news organizations uh, to make sure that they're raised uh, to the top when they're so even if they naturally events. don't get millions of views or found, you can you will hand pick the authoritative voices you're um, willing to raise up. Oh, what, what we do is you know uh, we have we have worked with many news publishers in in every country around the world to um, to make sure that they plug into our news features uh, top news shelf breaking news shelf you know that we trigger when it, when the, whenever there is a news event and people are want to search for lots of news and there we're pushing authoritative sources mm -hmm. of content the publishers that we have worked with for a long time so it's precisely the opposite of reduce right they, they get extra push and the last one is reward uh, it's reward and that's our youtube partner program which is the single largest partner program in the world we have two million uh, uh, partners in it getting paid from YouTube. Uh, in the last three years, we've paid out $30 billion. And, um, $30 billion? $30 billion. billion. How much of that is in the UK? In the UK, $1.7 uh, uh, billion in the last year, pounds, um, creating roughly 30,000 jobs, according to Oxford Economics. This was 2019, actually. It's incredible, so, actually. So it's, I don't think people really realize the scale of that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty, you know, when you, when you think about the, the payouts today, we're roughly neck and neck with Netflix on revenue. Today, actually, we're slightly larger and growing faster. So when you think about our payouts, uh, we are now the largest content licensor in the world. And I want to know a bit more about that uh, paid partnership in a, in a minute, but just going back to the harmful content thing, just to, just to clear that bit up. I mean, w during the last sort of 15 months to two years, was there a, a real sort of oh shit moment when you thought, hang on a minute, people are burning down 5G towers, we have to do something about this? Yeah, so, so the... And I'm honestly, I'm representing. I'm doing that because I'm assuming you got a phone call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got a phone no, call, so go quick. I'm, I'm representing the work of... Um, you know, hundreds and thousands of uh, people whose names no one will ever know, right. who are just doing an incredible job every day. They've been at it for a very, very long time, and we actually had a huge amount of work and policy to open in the last five years, which is, uh, which is something that allowed us to act really fast, for instance, on the tower example, um, yeah. the 5G tower example What's really that you're fast? mentioning. What's really fast for you? Because it, mean, it was over a weekend, wasn't it? You had yeah, that one was it. over the weekend. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that there was not a development of a brand new policy. We had mm. policy against harmful content that we've developed. We were just able to include new content type that was very specific in, in, you know, in the UK and was obviously harmful. It would be very irresponsible for us to develop something within, as a principle, you know, we would be very unprincipled if we developed a brand new policy, you know, within 48 hours. That's, you cannot do that well. But because we had done so much work over the years to develop those, this was uh, fairly, um, uh, you know, it was much easier to add on uh, on a timely basis. Yeah, it says here that since last February, um, you've removed one, over a million videos yeah, that's right. related to dangerous coronavirus information like false cures or claims of a hoax. Yeah. And it and keeps rising, and we keep on adding, you know, we, we keep on looking for, you know, this is a living and breathing organism, so you have to constantly keep on looking for new ways that people may be looking to game the system. Um, so you've talked a bit about sort of the economic impact yeah. that YouTube has on the UK and globally, and you mentioned this YouTube partner program. That, tell us a bit about that then, because you effectively sort of, you, you pay a salary, do you, to, to YouTubers to prov keep providing the content? Yeah, I mean, I, w I wouldn't call it a salary. Right. <laughs> but uh, but, they, uh, but they, it does become a regular revenue stream for them, so they, many of them um, rely on it, and, uh, and they build their businesses around it. The, the cultural impact that YouTube has, so we spoke about the economic impact, there's also the cultural impact. Yes. And, um, and it's quite important because on average, 55% um, uh, of uh, any YouTube channel's revenue is coming from outside their home country, so we're an export business. In the UK, it's actually 75%. Because it's you know it's just a, you know the UK has been very good at exporting its culture all around the world, 
So it's a huge export uh, uh, sort of platform. And I love that OS because, again, I, I come from a small country. Export is the game. Right? <laughs> like, that's the, like, you know, your market is not big enough. So, so I always look at export being a very key economic lever. Um, but the, 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 the cultural impact is so interesting because you have not only new talent, but you also have new formats and new content that are, uh, that are rising. And, and for us, it's wonderful to see channels, whether it's um, uh, science lecturers who are, um, you know, who are putting their classes on YouTube and giving access to people all around the world uh, to learn from them. You know, Ben had like four different amazing examples in his presentation uh, about the pop quiz and and um, Joe Wicks, of course. Joe Wicks, the big, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so exercise videos, etc. So because of the uh, unlimited show space nature of YouTube, there are so many other diverse types of content that are really difficult to pack into a 24-hour live stream on uh, linear television. So so it's something that's augmenting uh, sort of television programming in a much different way. The, the um, you know, we're really proud of the sort of learning aspect of YouTube, yeah. especially during coronavirus pandemic. There are a lot of people who are coming to YouTube, not just for information, but also for learning. Learning, whether it was learning, you know, people just kind of augmenting what kids were doing in school, so academic learning, but also just learning how to figure things out, just lots of good old how to, just learning how to fix things and bake things, you know, lots of, you know, new, you know everybody was baking, so there was, yeah. Lots of that. How to get a cork out of a wine yeah. bottle during lockdown was an amazive exactly. <laughs> <YouTube. laughs> when it gets stuck. That was one of yeah. mine. Um, but what's the what's the revenue split then? You know, for YouTube and the sure. uh, and the creators. Um, we we never officially publish it, but it's it's more than half than that uh, uh, creators, artists, media companies that they receive. So if you so if you watch our earnings call, the alphabet earnings calls in Q2, so you kind of can do the math in Q2. Our ad revenue alone was seven billion dollars globally, and uh, so you can do the math: more than half. Wow! And 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 it grew 83 percent year on year, so it was pretty significant. Um, and so it's it's quite a turnaround, isn't it, from the days of um, being accused of piracy to now sort of you know 25 percent of revenue going to the music industry or or, or whatever, yeah. um, and where the, you know there are premium products, subscriptions, and you know there are certain you know exclusive documentaries and so on on YouTube. I saw you interviewing, uh, well, Eugene Liang, who was uh, you took to the Met Gala. And it was interesting because I saw you were interviewing him, weren't you? And um, you asked him, um, we're, going to, we're talking about diversity of talent uh, and, and, and opening up, you know, and uh, promoting more diversity. As Ben was mentioning, that every platform, every channel is doing badly at that, essentially. Um, uh, and you asked him, because he, what is it that YouTube can do better? Yeah. What did you learn from him? Uh, and what is your view on it? And what, what is it that YouTube is doing? So, so it was, so first, um, first I want to say that, you know, we, we talk about ad revenue a lot, and that is the bread and butter of what we do. But we've, in addition to ad revenue, we've developed nine other ways to make money on YouTube. Uh, I recently published a blog on it, so it's it's all you know it's all public out there, and um, and that is that is a way that's one of the benefits that we have as a direct to consumer platform that we can give creators and, and media companies different ways to monetize their content, and many of them have developed into very very significant revenue streams, uh, whether it's you know v selling virtual goods, there are more than 10 million creators who have been uh, 10 million people who have purchased a virtual good on YouTube Meaning? from creators. Uh, they paid for stickers. Uh, they paid to have their comments pinned to the top. You know, and this is all money going to creators, artists, media companies. Um, um, there are channel membership subscriptions to individual channels. That's a very fast growing revenue stream uh, for, for our partners. And so there, there are many others. When you do that, uh, creators, artists, media companies, they can, they can basically, well, let me talk about creators, they can expand you know, vertical and horizontally. They build their audience, become really popular, start making money from ads on YouTube, become sort of a steady paycheck, and then they figure out what other ways they can make money. It diversifies their revenue stream, which, by the way, during sort of the rocky nature of coronavirus has been incredibly helpful for them. And... Um, and then they start expanding horizontally, meaning their brands 
which means they start getting into you know, selling products, which they can do whether they, they do it on YouTube or on other platforms. Um, they do television programs with you know, some of the broadcasters right. who are here. I mean, Mo uh, Gilligan is a great example, yeah. isn't he? You yeah. know, of somebody who was huge on YouTube. And then yeah. is it satisfying to see, for you to see when you see traditional broadcasters you know, scoping YouTube to find their, yeah. their next big talent that they might put on their for sure, channel? Because I, I always look at it as it's brand building. Right? They, they build a brand and they monetize it horizontally. And nobody is exclusive to anyone. And the bigger the brand is, they always know where they come from and, and what gives them uh, broader exposure, et cetera. So, of course, every brand wants to be monetized as broadly as possible, which includes broadcasters and includes merchandise and includes many different, uh, different things. So, so we love that. And when you do that, and when you create all these revenue streams combined with unlimited show space, you start giving birth to diversity mm. because anyone can do that. I mean, you know, not everybody succeeds, but anyone can do that. Everybody can try. That's a so, conversation all parents have with their kids when they say they want to be YouTubers. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, don't look at exactly. the successful ones. <laughs> but, but, it, but it's, you know, but it starts reflecting society. It starts giving you a chance uh, at uh, much more diverse sort of creators and content. And you have um, a Black Creators Fund, don't you? Is that right? Yes. So uh, we started that last year. We did our Black Voices Fund to make sure that uh, we actually bolster a hundred million dollars hundred million dollars that we bolster the uh, the creative community uh, and you have the uh, black fan uh, youtube black fan fest youtube black fan fest we have uh, fan fest in in uh, asia that we've been doing for a long time so we, we focused on we have um we have lots of efforts that we're doing around female creators yeah. so we've, we've basically focused on we call it communities and we focused on community de development on youtube because it's something it's the same as hiring Right? If you're hiring, and unless you pay attention to diversity, unless you're always taking the extra step to make sure that you have diverse set of candidates, if you just take the easy way out, it just like you never change anything. Same with creators. Yeah. Right? So we just keep on uh, keep on doing that, and it takes a while to for it to bear fruit, but you just have to stay at it and keep on executing. Yeah, and bringing those people into the mainstream. Right. Uh, and letting them rise to the top, Correct. right? Yeah. Uh, what's interesting also, you know, diversity isn't obviously just about race, it's, uh, it's about, um, about being working class, about poverty mm. and all of those sorts of things, uh, as you know. And in the UK during, during lockdown, it became very clear that I think there's a 9% of families don't have access to the internet. And therefore, when homeschooling was happening, there was a yeah. hu there's a huge educational gap now that is very difficult to backfill because they, they had no access to the internet. Um, it's not a responsibility of YouTube to provide, you know, laptops and things to children, but it, do you feel there is a moral responsibility in that, you know, the ethos of YouTube is to give a voice to as many people who want it yep. free to air? Yeah, so, so, so we would do the things that we can on that front, and one of, the, one of the moves that we did, and this was up on ask from many politicians and telco providers and cable providers, is that we would reduce the fidelity of our videos uh, during coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, basically, we just downgraded from HD to SD mm. uh, as much as possible because there was a lot of load uh, overall on the internet because everybody was at home, everybody was streaming to work, etc. cetera. So, um, so I think us and, and other platforms as well, Netflix and others, we've all, been, uh, we've all reduced the fidelity of it. And um, so that's, that was like one very quick, meaningful move to sort mm. of uh, allow for uh, better experience for everyone. We also work with telcos to make sure that our videos actually function really well in low bandwidth environments, mm. right? Which is really, you know, everybody hates to get the spinning wheel and, uh, and buffer. Um, there's so much work that goes into not making it so. And not just on our side, but also <laughs> on the telco side. Um, obviously, we cannot affect the actual ownership of uh, the connection, yeah. but we, we can affect whether they work and, um, and, and work well, so. Um, we, we have less that. than a minute. What's next business-wise? <laughs> In less um, than 60 seconds, I'm just I think joking, we've, but. you know, I, I think this decade is going to be one that will change retail quite a lot, and a lot of retail will move on to, um, you know, social commerce will be a big theme. Um, every creator that I was just speaking about, every media companies, they'll be able to transact and sell on their channels, um, whether it's on our platform and other, other platforms. And uh, that's, a, that's going to be a very, very big theme. I think the first theme was disruption of video. First decade was disruption of video, audio. Second decade, disruption of video. 
and the third one is disruption of uh, uh, commerce. And um, so we're busily uh, working on that. It's a very long-term um, uh, project for everyone. But, uh, but I think anybody who builds a large audience will be able to benefit greatly by reaching audience and selling merchandise online. Um, and you were saying to me earlier that these days in your, in your own life, the way you manage your own time management, everyone's always interested in how people manage their lives, is that you now prioritize sleep over exercise. Yes. Is that right? Is that how? <laughs> when I have to choose, so I, I don't like if, if I have to choose between the two, but like for instance today I had to choose, um, I prioritize sleep. I used to get up every time I would travel somewhere and, and run. If I can sleep, I'll sleep over that. Yeah, it's, it's better. better. Sleep is the big thing. <laughs> sleep is the big thing. Um, why we sleep is the book to read. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, why we sleep. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Robert Kinsel, thank you so much for your brave counsel, for your wishful thinking, for your hopes thinking. for the future, as your name tells us you're all about. Uh, a great joy to talk to you. Thank you great so much. Great to be here. Thank you so much.